I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. I don't like the word life hacks. It sounds kind of cheesy, like, oh, if I do this, I'm going to manipulate all these people. But I do think there is something to be said for making little tweaks to optimize your life, to make it a little better. And there are people who've had a lot of experience at different types of ways of living life. And if you can benefit in small ways from that, then do it. So I'm going to go straight to the next one, which is called the advice hack. And I've used this hack a lot, and I'm almost afraid to talk about it because I'm afraid I won't be able to use it again after I talk about it. (laughs) Because people will say, oh, you're using the advice hack. And, or I'll I'll tell you a situation where it's worked with my kids. So my oldest daughter, uh, unfortunately, goes to college. (laughs) And I was very much against it. I've even written a book, 40 Alternatives to College. And I've written a ton of articles about student loan debt and and so forth. But um, whenever I used to try to talk to her about it, she would literally, if if I would say to her, listen, we got to talk about college and your alternatives, she would just literally turn around and walk away. And... So I had to change the way I talked to her about it. And I had to say, look, give me advice on how I can talk to you about education. Like, what would be a way where you wouldn't walk away? And so even though it did end up that she was going to college, we were able to have many discussions about it. And she's always aware of her alternatives. So, and and, and it also gives her fuel for her to to talk to me about if she has problems in in school or, or whatever. So what made you do that? You had your wits hand? No, no. I I realized, look, she's an adult. And uh, when she's 28 or 29 years old and having a serious problem, I mean, the older you get, the more serious the issues you could have. Um, I want her to feel comfortable talking to me. I didn't want her to think I was her enemy. Yeah. And that was high stakes enough for me that I used the advice act. It only really works in high stakes situations. You know, if you're going to be working with somebody or dealing with someone in a high stakes situation, it's not like you versus them. Saying the word advice implies you're working together. In the words of Pitbull, the rapper, he says, ask for money and get advice. Ask for advice, get money twice. So there is a way. Yeah. Okay, back for part two of the One Minute Life Hacks podcast with Steve Cohen. Steve, what did you think of the other life hacks? I thought it was I, really good. Have it, you started using them? I did start using them. What, are you, what have you done? Uh, I, um, I definitely like the idea. I haven't 
stolen any of your waiter's pads, but I do like that idea. So I used to use um, spiral notebooks that were really big, and I have to steal some waiter's pad. But I, I, I at least got down to a smaller notebook, like kind of like a small spiral kind of thing. But the Rat- thing with the spiral is you have to fit in, you can't fit it in your pocket. Yes. I know when the spiral I, I, unwinds, it, it No, but I was talking about even like a small you. like note index card. But again, waiter's pad is the way to be. I have to do that. And um, I'm going to go to your apartment and take some. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to be a rock fella. I even got got a list on it. Yeah, give it to me. It's a collector's item I could put on eBay. (laughs) Um, That was one. And I I know um, I was trying to think of some of the other things that we had said. Um, I know that the life hacks that I talked about, I continue to do. Like what? Um, I definitely am careful about the words I use. And so if I'm if somebody emails me and says, I'm running 10 minutes late, I'm not like, no problem, because I don't want to throw in the word problem. Yeah. You know, if, you know what? I, yeah. I use that one as well. Have yeah. we ever talked about this? I think we've talked about this. We might have talked I, about it on Friday. <laughs> I don't like saying no problem because it's yeah. not, it's not um, there's no problems anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, so and language is important. Yeah, 100%. You, you know, there's a sign, there's a TED talk about this where um, I forgot the name the of the TED woman. TED talk about everything. <laughs> but but there, she describes this um, indigenous culture. I don't yeah. know what indigenous means, but it's, you know, f- they've never had contact with civilization and they have no words for left and right. They only have words for north, south, east, west. So, for instance, they, if they see a fly, they'll say, oh, there's a fly that's south, southeast from you. Like right next to you. Oh wow! And uh, oh, that's interesting. And, and and it turns out because that's their language, that they're actually much more aware of what's what where the directions north, south, east, west are than you know than than humans previously thought possible for humans. So some animals are very uh, uh, attuned to north, south, east, west, but we think yeah. they always explain it like, oh, there's magnets in their beaks or whatever. Huh. Um, but humans could be just as attuned. It's just a matter of the language they use. Absolutely. And I think many people have talked about the, you know, the inherent biases in language where it's, whether it's sexist, where the word hysterical comes from uterus or people say for a lot of The word hysterical comes from uterus? Yeah. And so it's the implication is that, oh, women are, you know, more Uh emotional. And so there's a lot of words like that. And, um, and I think, yeah, we have to be careful about the words we use and not too mealy mouthed or timid about it, but I think mindful. So we have we have a couple of life hacks today that very directly involve use of language as life hacks. But first I want to ask our audio engineer, do you hear some kind of reverb in when we're talking? Um no, not really. I kind of hear an extra sound. I don't hear any reverb. I don't hear any reverb. <laughs> And by the way, keep this in the podcast, this uh, aspect, because every podcast is, this is raw, yeah. the Wild West, doesn't need to be edited out. It's unfiltered. Do you still hear reverb? No, now it's gone. Yeah, it's from the, it, uh, it's, it's from the headphones. Okay. Yeah, oh, so, okay. and then I muted the headphones, so you don't, you don't hear yourself anymore. Okay, so, want to wanna dive right in? Yeah, we're excited. Thank okay. you, Jay, by the way, for muting the headphones. <laughs> Thank you, Jay, for muting the headphones. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it's a it's a very hard skill, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, this next rule is supposedly from Warren Buffett. I think actually there is some argument about the origin. It might not be from Warren Buffett, but it's called the five twenty five rule. And I I found this to be immensely valuable for me about a year ago. Like I was starting to accumulate so many things that I was doing in my life, like. I wanted to write a novel. I wanted to do stand-up comedy. I was running a business. I was in the business itself. There were many different products. I was doing a podcast. And my interests were getting to be too big. And I was trying to figure out how do I slim down my life? Because minimalism is not just about the items you carry around in your bag, but the items you carry around in your head. And I was getting too stressed out even on things that I love doing. So this is called the 525 rule. And again, it's attributed to to Warren Buffett, but I don't know if that's true. And, and he says, basically, list the top 25 things you love to do. 25, like make it as, as big a list as possible, 25 things. And then make two columns. On your right, put your first five, or uh, sorry, on your left, put your first five, 
and, and put the next 20 to your right. And then here's the interesting thing. Never, never, never look at the right, the things on the right list again. And it's interesting because people say, oh, only attend to the bottom 20 after you do the first five. No, his whole point is any time you spend on the bottom 20, even though they might be things you love doing they're, they're because they're in your top 25 thing, out of the billion things you could be doing in life, these are the top 25, so all 25 of them are important to you. Any time you spend on the bottom 20 as opposed to the top five will take away time you could have been spending on the top five, and you only can achieve excellence in so many things, and let's say five things. So his whole point is, Ne you know, never let yourself be distracted from the top five, even if it's by other things that you love. No, I, I absolutely agree. No, I think, and I think that we all have a hard time doing that because what bec what seems urgent we think is important. And I think, I also think somebody like Atul Gawande has popularized the idea of a list, you know, and it really helped efficiency in hospitals and he talked about the checklist for surgeons and even their efficiency got so much better. So I do think you manage what you monitor. So if it's there for you in front of you and you could see it, maybe you're more aware of what you're spending your time on. And I found that since I began working with you, it's very important for me to say, okay, thankfully when you're with entrepreneurs who have an entrepreneurial mindset and are very creative, you have a lot of opportunities and we have to say, okay, what's really worthy of our time and effort and what do we really want to do? What do we really want to accomplish? So I, I definitely uh, agree with what Warren Buffett has to say. I mean, you know, I, obviously if it's not him, he's pretty successful anyway, so you might as well peg it on him. Well, yeah. and you know, it kind of also brings to light like you can't, you know, obviously on my top five has to be, and I know on your top five is family. Yeah. So things had to drop for me. Like I had to be, in order to basically prioritize, you know, relationships and family. And then of course, you know, business is how, you know, I feed my family and, and this podcast is important to me. It kind of left room for only really one other thing. And I had to choose between, let's say writing, comedy, it, 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 you know, certain types of investing that required more of my time. So all of these things were on my bottom 20 and, you know, I had to figure out exactly what, what the top five was going to be. And it, it was, it was hard for me. And even then I had to slim down to make sure I wasn't getting overloaded with any one of these things too much, because if, 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 if you get, there's definite, definite truth to, being spread too thin. Also, there's that saying, you know, you're the average of the five people around you. You're also the average of the five things you spend the most yeah. amount of time on, not the average of the 25 things. If you, if you are, if you're the average of the 25 things you spend your most time on, you end up being nothing. Right. Well, it's like you're the, it's, I was gonna say, you know, if you don't stand for something, you fall for anything. And if you have certain things that you're kind of like inviolable, you're going to be better off and and you have we all have to recognize that you can't please everybody and you know people have said like the secret i don't know the secret of success but the secret of failure is trying to please everybody so sometimes when you're venturing down to numbers 20 through 25 maybe you're doing it for other people's or five through 25 yeah five six through, through 25. 25 yeah 100 percent. yeah i was definitely going to go down lower on the list and you have um, a lot of interest then <laughs> <laughs> but i also think and i was I know Susie Walsh had written a book called 10, 10, and 10, and I believe it was something to the effect like, let me think about things and say, is it going to matter 10 minutes from now? Is it going to matter 10 months from now, 10 years from now? And I do think we can all look back and say, you know, I was really worked up over that, and it really wasn't worthy of my time. And obviously, it's better to have foresight than hindsight, and sometimes it is good to to say, okay, it's not – what you want it's what you're willing to give up and sometimes you have to give up stuff to get stuff that's more important you know so uh, you know that's interesting um and i also i i i haven't read her 10 10 10 i imagine the things that are important 10 years from now are really not so important because you might be dead 10 years from now you in particular you know with your um, diet <laughs> <laughs> just kidding <laughs> or jay will kill me you know one too many insults to jay <laughs> Hair trigger temper. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think 
No, I think it could also mean that, okay, you're always going to have your family. So if you, you know, I read a review. Of, you just conducted a great interview with Mike Ovitz. And I read a review of his book, and it said that he was talking about how he really enjoyed his girlfriend or fiance's teenage daughter. And maybe implicit in that admission is that maybe he wasn't as present earlier with his children when they were that same age. So you'll never regret, you know, spending time with your children or, you know, or your parents or your family or your relatives. I mean, some of my relatives I might regret spending time with. But I think, um, no, I think I think you'll always appreciate it. That's, I know it's cliche. It won't be the first cliche I've said. It won't be the last one. But people on their deathbed are kind of like, oh, I was glad I was able to spend so much time with, you know, people, you know, because they're not going to be around forever. So I, I think, yes, I, I heard Warren Buffett, though I did hear Warren Buffett talk about seizing the moment, and he gave a speech where he talked about, okay, you guys are, he was speaking to a group of 20 year olds or, you know, college students. And he said, no, a lot of people put off a lot of things and, you know, having fun or ha being promiscuous even, or having relationships. And do you want to wait till you're having trouble with those same organs, you know, or do you want to do them now? Do you want to appreciate, you know, your vitality and at, at, when you're most vital. So I, I, I think these are very helpful. I like also the idea of combining Altul Gawande's uh, checklist yeah. uh, technique. You know, I think that book's the Checklist Manifesto. Yeah. And um, kind of, if you have your top five, to actually make sure you really are doing them and improving them. Yeah. Like may, maybe not once a day, but maybe every week. How did I improve in the the five things that I love doing the most? Because otherwise, what's what's the point yeah. of having in your top five if you're not kind of pursuing them and, and exploring their nuances and subtleties and improving at them? Yeah, and, you, and I know you do that. And I think you're probably irritable when you don't get a chance to do it. You know, I've watched your comedy improve, I don't want to say tenfold, but it's gotten a lot better because you've worked on it and what you measure. You're saying improves. I sucked before? <laughs> <laughs> no, because ten times zero would be zero. <laughs> you know, but I think that um, you worked at it and your writing obviously got a lot better over the years. I mean, you've always since I've known you, you've always been a very strong writer. Um, but I, yeah, I think and those are, those are important to you. I, look, it's it's often said that people will judge you by the decisions you make. So if you decide to get up and perform comedy three or four times a week or write something or go to dinner with this person. And and you give up a lot of things. You give up quite a number of things. You don't you go the opening of every envelope like where you could. You work on your craft, and that's what you need to do. So the next hack, I think this is also a Warren Buffett one, actually. I'm going to... Maybe it was Charlie Munger. He probably <laughs> stole his idea from... I'm I'm gonna skip this one actually. I I I don't I don't, I don't like that one as much. I'm gonna go straight to 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 the next one, which is I call the advice hack. Yeah. So so this one is um, I, and I've used this hack a lot, and I'm almost afraid to talk about it because I, I'm afraid I won't be able to use it again after I talk about it because <laughs> people will say, "Oh, you're using the advice hack." And, and nobody wants to feel manipulated. <laughs> well, and it's not even a manipulative one. It's like often, I'll give you a classic example. Let's say you're negotiating against someone who's an expert negotiator. Like sure. let's say they bought, let's say you're selling a company and they bought a thousand companies. Or, sure, or, sure. You, you know, um, and then, and, and the first thing they say to you is like, well, what do you want for your company? Right. And I don't know, they're, they're like a grandmaster at this. Like sure. if, a, if a grandmaster chess player plays a, a chess player straight off the street there's no there's zero chance he's gonna lose there's there's yeah. there's a, a a thousand percent chance he's going to win <laughs> and so so an, a, a a grandmaster negotiator is not gonna lose against um you know someone who's never negotiated sure. before and and by by lose it doesn't mean the the person who in a good negotiation both sides will feel like they've won so that's what will happen is the loser will feel like he's won but actually did not get yeah what he wanted what he could have gotten in the long term so often in a negotiation the grandmaster negotiator might say i'm not, I'm not saying this is a good technique or a bad technique but i'm just 
segueing into the advice hack, but the, the grandmaster negotiator might say, sit down and say, so what's, what's the value of your company? What do you want to, what do you want right. me to pay? And this is where the advice hack kicks in. I always reply, listen, and I'll use the grandmaster analogy. You're the grandmaster of this. I'm just, you know, I'm really just focused on my business. I have been for years. I built it up. Uh, I have no idea what it is, what, what it's like negotiating these things. You negotiate all the time. If you were to give someone like me advice on what to say now, what advice would you give? Right. And so I mean it very sincerely because I do think sure, there, sure. I only would say it to someone who I think has higher skills and status than me in that area. And usually I find when you say that, it brings them, they really do want to give good advice. They don't want to give you bad advice. So it kind of helps the negotiation along. Yeah, and last, and in part one of the Life Hacks podcast, we talked about the cognitive biases. And right, you're, you're flattering that person. You're showing humility. I mean, there's a lot of reasons that person wants to help you. And I remember... Similar to that is how you conduct yourself. And I think I remember people always felt like in order to have a lot of influence, you had to do a lot of favors for people like the godfather and always go out of your way. And a lot of times people will say, ask somebody for a favor, like, or ask advice. You know, like I know that whenever I've helped somebody, I might've helped somebody get an internship or a job. And you've certainly helped a lot of people. Chase helped nobody. But I think <laughs> that when you've done that, you feel a sense of obligation, like you invested in them. So you're making sure he's invested in it. And you're well, also testing them too. You're testing them to say, well, what I would do, James, is your company's only worth like $5. They're not going to say that. Well, you know? well, uh, what you're referring to there is the is related to this. Do you know the, the and I think we've spoken about it before on the podcast, but the Benjamin Franklin hack, which is right. where Benjamin Franklin was a young state legislator in, in Pennsylvania and he had an enemy, somebody, a much older legislator didn't like him. And Benjamin Franklin simply did this. He said, can I borrow uh, a book from you? Maybe we even talked about this on the last podcast. Oh, I no, know. I don't think so. No. But Benjamin Franklin said, can I borrow a book from you? And the guy was surprised and said, oh, sure. And he gave Benjamin Franklin the book. And a week later, Benjamin Franklin returned the book. And the guy was friends with Benjamin Franklin for the rest wow. of their careers. And the reason is, is there's a cognitive bias. If you do something for someone, your brain is telling, yeah. or your body is telling your brain, hey, I'm the type of person who does something for this person. So that older right. guy was saying, I'm the type of person who lends Ben Franklin books. I don't lend yeah. anyone else books. I lend Ben Franklin books. Yeah. So you start to be more nicely inclined uh, in other areas. So this advice hack is similar to that. You're kind of letting them do a favor for you. Now it happens to be a favor in a high stakes situation, like a negotiation, or I'm sure you could think of other, uh, you know, yeah. it, could, it could be a high stakes situation, like asking for a promotion or asking for a salary increase or doing a sale. Uh, uh, you know, you, you, you yeah. visit someone and I've seen this happen very successfully in a, in a sales situation. Um, I, I was in a meeting where we were all, it was one company selling to this huge, massive uh, Chinese company. Uh, the guys from China flew in on a blizzard in their private jet, and we're all sitting around this conference room, and the meeting went horribly. It was the worst possible meeting you could imagine. And one guy on the team, actually, he's been on this podcast before, uh, Scott, Scott Cohen, uh, one guy on the team said, okay, this meeting obviously didn't go well, what advice could you give us so that we could take the next step and this meeting could go move forward? And then once he said that, everything, the tension kind of subsided. Like the guy wasn't, the guy from China wasn't yelling at us anymore. And uh, the tension subsided. And the guy said, well, if we, if you could show us this, this, and this, then we'll move forward. And, 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 oh. and suddenly, um, you violated that last hack we talked about is getting rid of your phone. I know. I uh, That's because I'm using yeah. it as the, my hotspot today. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, I, I know. I've, uh, it's about your priorities. <laughs> no, that shows we're, doing the, priorities we're doing the here. podcast that we work, so I didn't know if it, and I would correctly knew I would need a hotspot here. Yeah. But we work is great for providing the podcast facility, and this is an amazing space, but I just wanted to make sure I had a backup hotspot. Yeah. So I didn't answer the phone. Notice. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, so, that but. deal with. 
yeah, yeah. So, 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 so that was a case of using the advice hack in a sales situation that that basically saved a, a major high stakes situation. I think sometimes. I think where in relationships do you think that might work? Um, about being on. I think. I think it works in a, in, in a lot of the ways that you're talking about. Like it's that if if you're having a relationship with somebody and rather than you try and come up with all the solutions saying, okay, what would you want to do? And yeah, like empowers you're... them rather than, oh, you don't do this, you don't do that. Like, hey, where would you want to go? What would you like to do? What would be the outcome you want? And after a while, if they're not as forthcoming, same way with a guy in a deal with you, if they're not as forthcoming, you think maybe they're the wrong partner for you. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, 
on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. I'll tell you a situation where it's worked with my kids. So my oldest daughter, uh, unfortunately goes to college and <laughs> I was very much against it. I've even written yeah. a book, 40 alternatives to college. And I've written a ton of articles about student loan debt and, and, and so forth. But, um, whenever I used to try to talk to her about it, she would literally, if I, if I would say to her, listen, we got to talk about college and your alternatives. She would just literally turn around and walk away. And, so I had to change the way I talked to her about it. And I had to say, look, give me advice on how I can talk to you about oh, education. Yeah. Like what would be a way where you wouldn't walk away? And so even though it did end up that she was going to college, we were able to have many discussions about it. And she's always aware of her alternatives. So, and, and, and it also gives her, you know, fuel for her to, to talk to me about if she has problems in, in school or, or whatever. So what I don't know. What made you do that? Were you at the end or your wit's end? And no, no. I, I realized, look, she's an adult. And uh, when she's 28 or 29 years old and having a serious problem, as opposed to whether or not she should go, I mean, going to college is a serious issue, I think. But the older you get, the more serious the issues you could you could have. Um, I want her to feel comfortable talking to me. I didn't want her to think I was her enemy. But if I said, yeah. no, you can't go to college, and then she was just miserable and hated me. So at some point, your kids are adults, and they, they need to make decisions for themselves. But I still wanted to have the conversation with her so, she, so she'd at least know my opinion. Yeah. And that was a high high stakes enough for me that I used the advice hack. It only really works in high stakes situations. Yes, but I, I've been in situations where you were in a negotiation and with people at work and they they have to they have to i think it works when both people have stakes it's when yes. adam grant talks about you know when you're dealing with a giver or taker or it works when you have a giver and a giver when you know and that's instructive too you either win or you learn and you may learn who you're sitting across the table from and that person isn't worthy of you doing a deal if they're not going to be forthcoming if they're not going to see it as a win-win right if someone you says, don't want to deal with them yeah if, if someone says oh don't try the advice hack on me i just heard you talk about it on the podcast you could say the truth which is i legitimately want to learn like that's why I'm negotiating with you. I want to, you're, you're the person who's the expert. So I want to sell my company. You know, I'm yeah, making no, that scenario a, no, up. And, but. and, you know, doesn't, doesn't mean it has to be duplicitous or oily right. on your part. And it's not unlike with King Solomon where one person, you know, you, you'll find out who wants more in any, in any kind of negotiation. And that's what you want. You want somebody who cares the same way you do and so they should want you to do well in that deal or to be fair and you're not you know you might uh be in a way coming uh, underestimating your acuity when you're dealing with somebody saying you're the grandmaster you know to that person but i think uh 
you are savvy enough to know if that if somebody's giving you a deal that's not kosher for you. So yeah, right. So it doesn't have to be Machiavellian. That like Benjamin Franklin's no. use of it seemed Machiavellian a little bit, but it could be a sincere, you know, uh, forthcoming. Yeah, of course. I think it can be, of course. And and, and and it's use of the word language. Again, it's the use of language. Like advice yeah. implies, you know, if you're going to be working with somebody or dealing with someone in a high stakes situation, it's not like you versus them. Saying the word advice implies you're working together. In the words of Pitbull, the rapper, just much like Ice Cube was the rapper, not like the accountant. Uh, he says, "Ask for money and get advice. Ask for advice, get money twice." So there is a way. Like so, yeah, that's, you know, that's good. Pitbull yeah. had the advice hack. Yeah, exactly. You probably taught it to him, or Warren <laughs> Buffett. You know? uh, so this next hack, I've totally violated today, but I I explained my reason why. But but there's a there's a there's a deeper nuance to this hack. But the hack is called leave the smartphone at home, huh. which I have my smartphone <laughs> right here, but. I've been doing this for almost two months now. Yuval Harari was on the podcast, and Yuval Harari wrote Sapiens. He wrote Homo Deus. He wrote 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, and one of the smartest people we've ever had the opportunity to have on the podcast. And one thing I thought was interesting is he didn't have a smartphone on him. And, and you know, uh, I th he gave a bunch of reasons. Like I said, what if you had to meet somebody? And he said, well, we'll arrange to meet and then meet. <laughs> He, you know, it's not right. like, you know, show up at 2.30 and we'll just text yeah. each other. Uh, it bec you become much more concise about your plans. And then the other thing is he, you know. Well, How do we ever do it before cell phones? Right, and, he, and he kind of implied, which I then researched further, he kind of implied with the obvious, which is smartphones are not productivity enhancers. They're productivity wasters in most cases. Yeah, absolutely. Like you think they're enhancers because, oh, while you're in a cab, you could be answering emails and responding to things and you get a lot more done. But so for, for a month and a half or two months, I've been not carrying the smartphone around. And even though I'm carrying it around today as a mobile hotspot, yeah. I don't actually use it as a Listen, one murder, you're not Jack the Ripper. <laughs> but if I have, you, you've seen me not carrying it around. 100%. And, and I find two things. One is, so there's three things. The third is the research. But the two things I've noticed personally is that I'm able to read and think a lot more. So like if I'm in a cab, usually the other person's looking at their phone, like just whipping through Instagram, and I'm reading a book or thinking about things or looking outside or yeah. working on my waiter's pad or whatever. The other thing I've noticed is that when I get home, it's not like I then, you know, spend four hours on my email. I'll go to the email. I'll see there's three emails. I'll see, I'll see within seconds. There's three emails I have to respond to. I'll respond to all three. And that's my email time because I great. haven't been spending yeah. all those hours Checking email, checking email, checking email, checking Instagram, checking Twitter, checking Facebook. Well, I'd, I'd say it's two things is, you know, I, sometimes we confuse activity with accomplishment and we're just busy and we're trying to figure, do stuff just to do it. And we're so used to doing it. And I remember I was listening to something the other day and they talked about how anything will get our attention, like with your phone or any stimulus, if it's new, if it's threatening or if it's pleasurable, you know, and that. So one of those three things will kind of wake us from our stupor or or dis distract us. And I think people, yeah, I think the people who need to get in touch with you know where you are and, you know. Or even like if, uh, you know, there's always a worst case scenario. What if one of your kids is hit by yeah. a car and is in the hospital? Well, she's already been hit by the car. <laughs> I know this sounds awful, but she's already been hit by the car. I can't stop her from being hit by the yeah. car. And having the cell phone usually won't get me there that much faster to get upstate. Sure. So it'll just make me worry more and be more anxious. I guess if there's a life-threatening decision I have to make, but that's never happened in my life, actually. So the odds of that are very small. And and usually I'm not really that... I mean, usually I'm home. I work at home, so usually I'm yeah. not that far. So in my home, I'll use my cell phone, but just not outside of my home. Yeah, I think, no, I think it's... Great. I mean, I haven't been successful in adopting that plan, but I, I think maybe another hack I thought was really instructive was when people say, if you're going to take on a new activity, whether it's working out or doing stuff that you don't 
maybe like that much, maybe just try a very small interval of it, you know? So if I'm addicted to my phone and, you know, I heard somebody the other day talk about, like, if you wake up and you drink whiskey, people are going to think you're an alcoholic. Like, you know, there's a pejorative of like, you're waking up at eight in the morning and, but everybody does that with their phones. So I do think there's some merit to the idea that people are addicted to technology or have fear of missing something. But what I was going to say is just maybe try for an hour a day or two hours. I mean, we, as you've said, like, check your phone 260 times a day. And, right, so that's the other thing. Yeah. So, so, so I did the research, and, and you just said people on the, on the average check their phone 260 times a day. That's not the answer. People, well, this is different than checking, but people touch their cell phones 2,600 times a day. Yeesh. And they spend, the average American spends four hours and 40 minutes every day wow. on their cell phone. Now, I spend time on my cell phone every day as well, but at home. If I'm out, yeah. I probably save myself two hours a day. Now, but you bring up something interesting, which is, and this is get relates to the, the other nuance to this life hack. For all of our podcasts, we're talking to, the smartest, most successful people in the world. So I try to always get a takeaway that I then research on my own to see if it works yeah, or not. Absolutely. But, I, but I, I try to get at least, you know, a couple of takeaways or at least one from each guest. And it really, you know, I want this pod, I'm not a journalist. I want this podcast to improve my life. And that's why I, we have the guests that we have. That's why we always yeah. talk about the guests. Like, is this, will this guest improve my life? And will improve the listeners' lives. So, so as an example, we had on Aubrey Marcus, the CEO yeah. of Onnit. He recommended uh, every morning, and he gave some scientific research. Uh, you know, t- take cold showers, like yeah. freezing cold, ice cold showers. Put it on the icest temperature yeah. possible. So I do that every morning, and it's you still do it. I still do it. You're I did on it. your own there. I did it today. Yeah. <laughs> I still do it. I, I, and I. He, he recommended. Take a full glass of water, take an ice cold shower, and do twenty five push ups. So first thing when I wake up, I do those wow. three things every and day. Are you, do you feel better from? Doing... I don't know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I do them. But you, fe- I think you feel. You might not feel physically better, but you feel. It's hard to know how you would have felt otherwise, but I think I feel more alert in the morning as a result. Keep a commitment to your commitment. Yeah, you know. So it, good for it, you. It, You're it, on your own there, but I mean, I think there are certain things I don't necessarily need to do. I mean. I shower once a week whether I need to or not. <laughs> but I think that, um, no, that's a tough one. Yeah. And, and you know, we've had on Ariana Huffington talking about sleep. And she mentions how even having the cell phone next to your bed, yeah, even if it's off, worsens your ability to sleep. And, and you know, she has so much research about how important sleep is. I mean, it's a life or death thing, the quality of your sleep. You, you'll actually live yeah. longer lifespan just if you're if you sleep more deeply so i've started plugging in you know i used to just i used to read because i was didn't have any books because i was minimalist i was carrying around without any books i used to read on the kindle on my phone and then i would just plug the phone in when i went to sleep but now i plug the phone in in another room so it's not even there when i wake up it's not there in the middle of the night there's no temptation to check it at like two in the morning uh there's no glow from it uh, so, so that was the takeaway from, from that one that I don't, but that was a way to, to kind of we, start weaning myself yeah. off phone. Then another person suggested, I forget who, take off all the apps on the phone. So if I go on Twitter, I don't have the Twitter app. I just go on Twitter via the Chrome app on yeah. the phone. So that s- started to save time on my phone. I'm not instinctively getting Twitter notifications and then checking yeah. Twitter. And, you know, I I got rid of all the games, all the apps, everything. And then Tony Robbins, a takeaway, bring the target closer. So uh, he was using that to explain how he taught Marines how to shoot better. Okay, don't start them off shooting targets 100 feet away. Start them off shooting targets 5 feet away. So it's like what you said. Okay, maybe... One out of two days, I won't. Or if I'm yeah. just taking a walk around the block, I'm not going to bring my cell phone with me. Yeah. And you build up. Or, 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 you know, what I did was, and this is a takeaway from Tim Ferriss, don't commit long-term to to a, a habit change. Do it as an, a, commit to an experiment for a week. So the yeah. Harari thing, I said, okay, I'll do an experiment for one week. And it's turned into, you know, six or seven weeks later, or maybe even more, where I, I, 
I don't really bring the smartphone out unless it's targeted use as a mobile hotspot. So it's it's important yeah. to kind of get all these different takeaways from from the different podcasts. They're not here just for I like them to be entertaining, but I want to improve my life with each one. These are the most smartest people on the planet. I'd be stupid not to, yeah. to listen to something they say. No, and and I'll say it's been a year in and uh, a little like probably thirteen months, and I've learned a ton of stuff from all of our guests, and that's why we're doing this. You know, we want to improve the lives of other people. We want to improve our own lives, and yeah. And so speaking about that, like listeners, if you have any advice for us, we're, we're more than happy to take it. Oh, yeah. If, if someone wants to tweet out life hacks or post life hacks in the in the Facebook Choose Yourself community, which is a great community, post away. This is or, or on Instagram, I'll post all of these as well. So follow me on Instagram at, at Altature. But enough self-promotion. Let's get on to the next hack. And this one comes from another podcast guest, Robert Cialdini. It's the because hack. Uh, did you know this b- hack at all before uh, reading Robert not, Cialdini? I did not know it before Robert Cialdini. So, so basically, the first there was a couple of experiments, and the first experiment was if you say, um, you know, uh, I don't, I don't know the specific example to use. If you say, uh, give me that book, uh, versus uh, give me that book because it'll benefit you a lot. Um, the person who says, give me that book because it'll benefit you a lot is much more likely to get the book sure, from you. Sure, sure. Um, but then it turned out something really interesting. Um, if you say, give me that book because you're giving me that book, <laughs> so that's called placebic information. You're not actually adding yeah. anything to the after the because. It's really the same information content as just give me that book. Yeah. But you'll have the exact same results as wow. the person who says, give me that book because it'll be of great benefit to you. Wow. So it's the word because somehow triggers something in the brain that automatically makes you want to do something. And there's, I don't think they know why that works. I imagine. And it's a huge it, statistically significant yeah, result. And I'm sure part of it's the Pavlovian response. You hear because, and even when the kid says, well, why can't I go? Because, I mean, you, but I also think you're conditioned because you expect most people to have a logical conclusion. And a corollary to that is when you go into stores and they have, we're so conditioned to say sale and it might be 10 cents lower and you'll buy it. Or it could, they've they've shown stuff where it's a sale and the price is higher and people buy it. So sale is a trigger because is a trigger. And I wonder what the research is on sale. I wonder if that actually does... Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I know when we do advertising for products, discounts work, but I don't know if that's just because it's cheaper or because people yeah. feel like they're getting a bargain. I don't know what the answer is. I think I remember this guy, and I did this I was did this once when I was in college, and he wrote something in the LA Times, and he said, he just had this ad, and it said this guy Leo Rostin who wrote the Joys of Yiddish and other things. And he one time he put in the L.A. Times, he put this classified ad for Craigslist, <laughs> eviscerated all everybody else's ads. Thanks for giving money to journalism, Craig. Very nice of you. Uh, former guest on the podcast, right? Do we had Craig Newmark? No, no, oh, we no. Didn't. Well, future guest. We tried. Guest. We oh, tried. Craig, you'll come. Thanks for giving <laughs> twenty million to NYU. But he in the L.A. Times it said last day to send in dollar. And it didn't say why, and people sent in dollar because there was an urgency and there was a time limit, and people always have fear oh, yeah. of missing I think something. I've heard about this. How much did they yeah. send in? I think thousands. I mean, yeah. thousands of people sent it. Now, yes, maybe P.T. Barnum was right, the sucker board every minute, but I think there are triggers, and there are a lot of things that make people do things that they're doing. And, I mean, Cialdini's got a million of them in his book, you know, and you had done a great interview with him. You know, so I definitely think so. Um, like you're in a store, you're listening to your headphones, you're distracted, you're checking your phone, you see sale, and you're like, okay, because you want to feel good about yourself for doing something. That's why we do it. Like it's why why do we do any habit? Because it's pleasurable, and it's as much the idea of you feeling like you saved money rather than the actual saving of the money. Like is a dollar or two on paper towels going to mean as much to you? Or but hey, you feel like. I'm the kind of person who looks for sales. I'm the kind of person who um, gets value. Or, or maybe with the because hack, I'm the type of person who needs a, a rational reason. Sure. Even though, 
even though basically, and this is a takeaway from both Robert Greene and Scott Adams, basically yeah. most of our behaviors, and actually, who else talked about this recently? I think Yuval Harari, actually. Uh, there's sort of this myth that we have total free will, will when reality is we're mostly irrational and ruled by all these biases. So you might as well understand these, you know, so-called laws of human nature or cognitive biases or whatever. But uh, the because one is interesting. So if someone says, um, oh, you want a promotion? Why should I give you uh, a promotion? You could, you could, you have two choices. You could say, well, I did this, 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 and this. And, and Or you could say, you should give me a promotion because I did this, this, and this. You'll have, be this hack shows you'll oh, have better results by taking the second approach, oh, making sure you can fit the because That's in the sentence. Yeah. Um, and then I'll just say with Robert Cialdini, one of the most, just as since we're listing takeaways of, of podcast guests, the, the takeaway I always, the most important takeaway I get from him, other than the because hack, is listing the objections. So if you're trying to sell something, or, or let's say in the case of why should I give you a promotion, yeah. if you say the objections before the other side says, says them, sure. so you might say, uh, um, well, here are some reasons why you might not give me an right. objection. I have less seniority. Right. I have, uh, uh, I just got promoted two weeks ago. I, I, um, uh, you know, I, I just sure. had a baby, so I won't be worrying. You know, you can list all the objections, and then you answer them. And the important thing is, he, he's thinking, you're the other side, he or she is thinking anyway what the objections are. If you bring them up before they address them, then it comes off, and it is, in fact, sincere and honest and authentic, and it shows you're thinking about all the issues. And then there's nothing they can say to argue with you when they're trying to come up with an argument about why they shouldn't give you the promotion. Yeah, and I do that sometimes if I'm reaching out for people to come on our podcast and I'll say, no, it seems crazy and it always seems delusional, but hey, you know, if you don't ask, the answer is always no, and, and people appreciate it. Or, hey, if we could help you to do it. Like, I've had people, in, you know, as a producer, reach out to me and they weren't, they didn't seem aware and... It was always the old joke, like, I'd like a book on chutzpah, and I want you to pay for it. You know, they didn't have an understanding of what you wanted. So I do think it's disarming. You're disarming their attack for you. Moron, you've been here two, three weeks. Why should you need a promotion? <laughs> but I think it's disarming and shows awareness. And, 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 if you, and, yeah. and if you say, before you, before you answer yeah. yes or no to the promotion, let me... You know, I know I've only been here three weeks, but already I see blah 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 blah, and you give your plan, you know, and you list, you you give your your you 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 yeah. answer the objections first. By the way, for more on this, uh, we just made a video. Yeah, I was if about you, to say if, that. If you yeah. if you search on YouTube, Altucher and Eminem, you'll see the YouTube how Eminem uses cognitive biases to win rap battles. We we talk about really, the list. It was objections. really a great video, and you and Jay did a fantastic job. Um, and yeah, I think, you could you couldn't yeah. find a joke about Jay. I, I saw you reaching for a joke about Jay, but you couldn't quite find one. I, and the Doesn't words work of Billy time. Joel. I wanted to leave a tender moment alone. Like I didn't want to. You know, I just think it's not as effective if every single time I insult Jay. No, I thought it was really terrific. It's like also sometimes you have to give an unalloyed compliment. Like you just have to say, yeah, it was really good, and like you know, just appreciate. You know, excellent. So, so I thought it was really great. And I was proud to be so again. This involved is with it. this is part two of our life hacks. Check out the part one, which was the I guess the last podcast or within the last week or so. And um, uh, if you have any life hacks, again, share them with us on the Facebook Choose Yourself group, or follow me on Instagram and share it, or share it with me on Twitter. Um, and again, I don't like the word life hacks. It sounds kind of cheesy, like, yeah. oh, if I do this, I'm going to manipulate all these people. But I do think there is something to be said for optimizing, making little tweaks to optimize your life, to make it a little better. And there are people who've had a lot of experience at different types of ways of living life. And if you can benefit in small ways from that, then then do it. I, I was just going to say, I, I liked, for example, like a couple of life hacks, you know, that I've gotten from our podcast. I remember when you had Mike Massimino on, he talked about when he was an astronaut or if something went wrong, he would say, I'm only going to ruminate on it for three minutes or five minutes or whatever it was. And I think that's helpful. Yeah. I know Mel Robbins has said as much, a five-second rule. And I I have a tendency to perseverate on things and roll around in the mud. And you don't get clean rolling around in the mud. You get clean getting out of it. And so I think that 
I, I, I would like to think like every guest we've had, like we, we've gotten something valuable, but I remember that being very insightful, you know, for all of us to say, okay, you know, we, we screwed up, you know, and, uh, you know, so I definitely think that was very helpful. I'm trying to think what else I've got. I mean, I've gotten so many things from, from our guests. It's ridiculous. At we this like point. Amy Morin. I mean, yeah. Amy Morin. I think, she, yeah. I, by the way, when you say the word perseverate, yeah. Amy Morin used the word perseverate. Oh, she did? Oh, wow. That's like the first time I ever heard that oh, word. Oh, really? Oh, now, yeah. this is the second time I've heard that word. <laughs> so I'm going to have to use it. That's yeah. the, that's my takeaway here is I'm going to use the word per, yeah. perseverate means, I guess, thinking a lot about something. Yeah, yeah. I have never heard that word before, and now I've heard it twice in two weeks. Yeah. Um, um, all right, well. Thanks a lot, James. Yeah. Yeah. Well, once again, Steve, yeah, welcome to the podcast. Steve thank Cohen, you. podcast producer extraordinaire. And if you like these uh podcast hacks or life hacks rather or these podcasts about life hacks subscribe to the podcast follow me on instagram tweet at us some new life hacks we'll do a, another podcast about this down the road and we're, we're we're constantly keeping track of what we learn from our guests so we'll always be able to to summarize and um that's it thanks once again thank you see you soon it's good stuff AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.